I found Luke 9 um, and trying to sort out what to, what to share with you. I went back to um, went back to our book 100 Days for a Healthy Church. Remember that? Remember that? And um, we had worked up to um, about Easter time with that and um, announced our um, couple of projects we were working on and um, Joe announced uh, this morning about the meeting with what they're calling continuing on um, with helping uh, homeschool parents and um, we also announced at that time that we were going the process of ordaining Joe and we did that and um, Joe and his team have been working hard on the on the homeschool thing and so and then we kind of got a little bit sidetracked with all that so i went back to the where we left off in that book and um and it was about day 89 so we're getting there and um and came to luke chapter 9 and luke chapter 10 and um just a coincidence I wonder where I put my message. Oh, isn't it maybe this way? There it is. Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> Luke 9 is uh, um, so, so it. Heavenly Father, we God, we just um, we thank you, God, for that you um, that you care, that you're present, that you lead and direct, and you know we haven't got the foggiest idea of what we're doing or what direction. It, it seems like everything just got to spin right around in circles and. But you're right there to lead us, and you you asked us if we lack wisdom to ask, and we asked, and you just poured out your wisdom, and and um, just all these the the wonder of how you um, let us know that you're paying attention. It's not in the thunder, it's not in the earthquakes. It's your still small voice, and I thank you, God, for your voice. And your leading and your presence, and, um, and and your direction, and how you lead us, but even more so how you how you beat us up, <laughs> and uh, and transform us, so we can hear your still small voice, you cleaning out our ears and our hearts and our lives, and so that we can do as we can hear you. So, Father, that we would hear you this morning, not for our sake, for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. So, one of the ways is just fascinating how God, I mean, we read devotions and devotionals that have been written months, maybe even years earlier, and you read it, and it's right where you're sitting. You know, it's right, it's, it's, the words are, like, just, sometimes I, a couple of times this week, I check to see if the ink is still dry, uh, dried yet, and sometimes the words are just dripping in, in tears, your own tears, and, uh, one of, one of them, I'll just share a couple of quotes where I get the message that just came um, Shane Pruitt um, is a youth guy. Um, Joe um, quotes him quite often. He's one of the speakers that him and I got to hear when we were in Nashville this spring. And uh, he put out, he's wrote, he wrote this new book about um, revival. And 
church, we, we always talk about revival and man, how great it would be great. God just would do something, wouldn't it? be great. The reality is he is doing something that we'd have the eyes to see and the hands to handle, the mind to comprehend. He wrote um, in introducing this book, he says, look around, our world is divided in almost every way imaginable. Religion, politics, race, views on sexuality, and much, much more. On the surface, it might seem like the, the time is right for a movement of God. On the contrary, now is the perfect time for revival, for a movement of God. Not an emotional, not momentary, not feel-good type that comes and goes, but revival that changes hearts. When God changes hearts, churches change. And when changed churches change communities. which changes nations, which changes the world. When the world seems to be at its darkest, the Spirit of God has moved in a way that only He could. Yes, He can. Yes, you know, we just need to prepare our hearts to be ready when He does. So this morning, Luke chapter 9, Jesus is, um, he's, 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 he, he's, he has selected, he's gone, he's gone about doing some pretty fantastic things, and, uh, he's, he has sent out the beginning of chapter 9, he sends out the 12 to go out and experience ministry, and they come back, and there's an evaluation process there. And then he's getting ready, chapter 10, he's getting ready to send out the 72. So he's building, um, he's disciple-making. Disciple um, he, this Luke 9, the verses, I'm, I'm going to read... I want to read from just verse 51 to the end of the chapter, but if you look down through chapter 9, he's, um, he's sent out the 12, getting ready to send out the 22. In verse 10, he is feeding the, the 5,000. In verse 18, he has a conversation with his disciples about, who do they? Who, are, who, who? What are they saying about me? Who, who are they saying that I am? And then he turns to him and says, "Who do you say that I am?" And Peter says, famously, "You art thou the Christ, the Son of the Living God." And so you, you can see him building into his disciples. In verse twenty-two, um, one of two places in Luke nine where he predicts that he will be crucified. He said in verse 43, um, Luke 9, 43, that they're all amazed at the majesty of God. And while everyone marveled at these things, which Jesus did, rightfully so, he says, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But he did not, they did not understand what they were saying. That's the problem, but God is speaking. God is present. God is leading. He's pouring out his wisdom, his, his, his pre and it, we just don't understand it. And um, it was hidden from them, verse 45, and they did not perceive it. And they were, but, and, but they were afraid to ask. Ask him about it. And I think that's where it's called. It's called life. We we come to Jesus. We understand what He's done for us, and we accept Him as Lord and Savior. But that's the beginning of wisdom. And then we spend the rest of our life learning and growing and understanding. And with 
along with life that's distracting us from all that. And then verse, verse uh, they didn't perceive, uh, understand what they were saying. And then, so this, is, this was their reaction. Verse 46, a dispute rose among them. And they started arguing about who was going to be greatest in his kingdom. They understand that Jesus was was the Messiah. He was the promised one, and, and the promises of the promised one is to set up a kingdom. And they're so now that's all they can see is like how great we're going to be. And they're arguing about about that. And he says to them, Jesus perceiving their thought in their heart, he took the little child and set him set set him by and says, whenever he receives this little child in my name, it's verse forty eight. Whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For he who is least will be least among you will be great. So he just flipped the whole thing upside down. The world system is to for personal achievement and to achieve and get get high and be and be great. Jesus flips the whole thing out. You want to be great? You want to, you have to be served. You have to you want to be great? You want to be, you have to be the least. So again, they're just like, what is this guy talking about? And they, now, and then John answered, Master, verse 49, we saw someone uh, casting out demons in your name, and, and we told him to stop because he, he, he wasn't following us. He wasn't doing it our way. And Jesus says, don't forbid him, for who he was not against us is on our side. And then verse 51, so there's all this, these great things are going on and they're missing it. How many, how much great things are going on today that we're missing? I read a quote, a quote went flying through, um, and I, it wasn't, it was un, un, um, I don't know who wrote it. It was uncredited. It was just there. It says we repent enough to be forgiven, but do we surrender enough to be changed? I mean, Jesus is preparing his disciples for ministry. He's got the twelve. They sent them out. Now, the, now the twelve have come back, and they've, and presumably in the in the con, in the way this looks is. Now, 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 what they've been taught to do, now they're training others, and they're being sent out in Luke 10. So we're in the middle of this training exercise for flipping the world upside down. And um, they just, we just don't get it. Verse 51, I'm going to read till the end of the chapter. And it came to pass, all right, maybe I won't read the end of the chapter. Let's just look at this first line, first, not the end of the verse, the first line. It came to pass that when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This phrase is a, is a pivot point in the Gospel of Luke. His pivot point in the ministry of Christ. He's trained disciples, and now he's she's making the turn. He's making the tr turn to the cross. Um, it's been famously called the beginning, the first steps of the the Jerusalem journey. He's turning to go and do what God had called him to do, to go to the cross. When the time had. It says, uh, and New King James says, when it, it came to pass, when the time had come, uh, when it, the, the time being full, with by being fulfilled, now it's time. It's time to move forward, to be received up. Um, some translations say time for um, him to ascend. <laughs> and it could be ascend to Jerusalem, we don't know what really what he meant to ascend to the cross. Son of man must be lifted up. 
or could a view even beyond that where he ascends to heaven. This is a, a, a this now it came to pass in the fullness of this time, the time had come, and what did he do? He set his face like flint. He set his face and he set out resolutely. He uses that word steadfastly is the word resolutely. It's a firm, it's a steadfastness, it's a it's unshakable. There's nothing that's going to keep him from the cross. There's nothing that's going to keep him from ascending and sitting at the right hand of the Father. Nothing. Satan had already tr tried to throw the book at him, already trying to distract him, and it wasn't going to work. God's work is going to be accomplished. God's promises will be fulfilled. It, 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 it's done. <laughs> the war is won. We just celebrated D-Day. And I've said it before, I've heard it put together this way, that World War II was really won on the beaches of Normandy. They still had to go through the battles to get to Berlin, but the war was won at that point. The war's already won. You still got to go through these skirmishes, these little battles. And at times they seem like big battles, but the reality is the war's already won. Jesus is going to accomplish everything God set him to. He set his face steadfastly, resolutely to, the, to Jerusalem. We talk about being a disciple. And we talk about being a follower of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus just simply means that we follow Jesus. It means that we, as Comer puts it, we, we get to know who he is. Then we spend time with him, and then we do the things that he did. We learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we do that, we, we find ourselves setting ourselves aside and doing the things, and it's not that we're doing things for God, that God is doing his thing through us. We've got to get out of the way so he can do his things. We've got to get our, our even our minds resolutely set on Jesus. This, and then he then he says, and and I'll, I'm going to read the rest of the the chapter, and these verses aren't is not they're not a call to leadership. It's not a call to, um, it's not a it's not something that's just for uh, leading in mini a ministry. It's not just something. It, it's not even a call to doing things for God. This is is a, is a call of God at its basic levels to come follow Jesus. It's a salvation call at this point. What I, my, my, point, my point there is, is that this isn't just things for those who are moving on in leadership. This is for being a follower of Jesus. This high calling of this to be a follower of Jesus is a call for every Christian, as believers, as Christians. This is basic level stuff. This is not just for... This is for all of us. If you want to follow Jesus, it's a, it, it, number one, it's the, the highest calling. Number, number two, it's a, it's a high calling. <laughs> and it's a call, as Bonhoeffer puts it, the Christian call is a call to die. Jesus said, if you follow me, you've got to take up your cross and die daily. If you want to save your life, Jesus said you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll find it. We <laughs> Disciples didn't get it. I don't know how much we really get it. I think we're, this is a good spot for us. understanding its reality verse 51 now I'll read the rest of the chapter I'm sorry 
he came to pass that when the time came for him to receive up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent his messengers before his, before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they didn't receive him. The Samaritans didn't receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. But his disciples, James and John, saw it, and they said, Lord, do you want us to go and command fire to come down from heaven? And we'll take them out and consume them, just like Elijah did. And Jesus turned to them, Don't you know what manner the spirit you are of? For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Then they went on to another village. Now it happened that as they journeyed on the road, that someone came and said, if you look at the parallel passage in Matthew 8, it does attribute to a scribe. There's probably somebody who's educated, somebody who knows the scriptures, a scribe would know the scriptures, who studied the scriptures. So somebody that knew what was going on, probably, came to him, verse 57, someone, it just, Luke says, someone, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, bur holes birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay to, to lay his head. And then Jesus turned to one of the others that were following them along the road, and he said to them, he says, you follow me, follow me. The invite him. He said, Lord, uh, let let me let me go first, go back and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And then there was someone else that said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me first go back and bid farewell to in my house, to those in my house. Verse 62, Jesus said, No one having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 9, Heavenly Father, as we consider your word this morning, we're, we're looking at the whole idea of being a healthy church, healthy Christians, healthy followers of Jesus. And um, all these things that are going on that we try to interpret and make an interpretation of what's going on and why it's going on and what it all means, you just ask us just to get in line behind you and follow you and trust you for all of it. So as we take this time this morning to look at this passage, Father, just to help us help us to understand um, clearly that quite possible to um, not understand it. We see that in, even in the disciples who were right there walking behind Jesus, and they had trouble understanding it. But we have your Holy Spirit to teach us and to lead us to give us an understanding. Help us to comprehend, not for our sake, for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Another devotion that came this week through um, Thursday morning, Jim Atkins. Coincidence, the verse is Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Famous verse. We know that verse. <laughs> and uh, Stanley goes on to say, he says, um, this is an example. Uh, we set an example, actually, and Paul sets the example of allowing our old earthly ways to be crucified with Jesus, with the Savior. This can make us into, this can, can make us into truly impactful witnesses. Jesus takes up residence in us and works through us in a manner that profoundly touches and transforms other people's lives. So what Jesus did, if we're followers of Jesus, that's what he's going to have us do. It's a high calling to follow Jesus. 
So we're going to look at this, zero in on this little conversation Jesus has with the scribe, with, excuse me, with the others. The, obviously, there's others. He's had the 12, and now he's getting ready to send out 72. So there's, there's quite a group of people that say, I'm, gonna, I'm following this guy. He's fed the 5,000, but out of the 5,000, there's those that stayed in, in with him and wanted to learn some more. So he's he's teaching to them and and uh, this these these statements um, that he begins in verse fifty seven is what we're going to look at this morning this high calling to follow Jesus. So Jesus, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's coming. He's on his way to do what he came to do. He came to die. He came to serve. He came to go to the cross. He came to rescue us. Why? Because we needed rescuing. He rescues us from our sin. He rescues us from the penalty of sin. He rescues us from its, and now present and presently, rescue, rescuing us from the influence of sin. Rescuing us from us, as Tripp says, quite often. And this high calling to uh, proclaim and then to be witnesses, to just, just talk, just, just, what does a witness do? It talks about what they heard, what they saw, what they felt, what they experienced. About Jesus. This isn't a call to leadership. It's not a call to a higher discipleship. It's not a. It's a call to believe. It's a call to follow. It's a, this is who we are as believers, followers of Jesus Christ. It is a high calling. It's a call to faith. It's a call to trust. To know Him. To grow in our understanding, the grace and knowledge of our Savior, Lord and Savior, and then go out and proclaim it. This is who we are. And as a healthy church, we get clear out. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's kind of clearing out some of the distractions and just that resolutely, steadfastly <coughs> follow Jesus. It's a call to trust God for everything. It's a high calling, but the, the one, one of the, the fascinating parts about that high calling, it, that high calling, it's a call to what we've been designed for. We've been designed to trust God for everything. We've been designed to follow him. We've been designed to fellowship with him and walk with him, and he with us is how we're designed. Jesus is just trying to, he's not trying to, he's not trying to ruin our life. He's not trying to, to, to be he's trying to get us back to what why we're why we were created in the first place to be with him and to enjoy him to know him enjoy him forever <clears throat> so this high calling we call it a high calling because it's so other than the world's system the world's pursuit the, the world's pursuit of, of of personal ambition and personal achievement um, and, but this is, this is, it's a call, a call to who, who we are, who we really are, real life, real living. It's a call to trust. Adam screwed it up. It was set up that way. Knowledge of tree, knowledge of good and evil. God says, that's mine. Leave it alone. Trust me for that. Just follow me. We'll, we'll, we'll be, you'll be fine. This is what we all... And what did he do? He took it up, and now we gotta. That's why we're struggling. That's why we're struggling with right and wrong, and doing this, doing that, distractions and deception, and and, and disease and death, and all these things because we 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 took we're we're on a we're on a we're on a path of what we weren't designed for. You ever smell gasoline? It's a yucky smell. Sugar smells so much sweeter. Doesn't it make just something be sweeter? Our car would run better if we just poured sugar, sugar water in there. It's so, it just smells so lovely. How's your car going to run with sugar water in a gas tank? They don't call it a sugar water tank. They call it a gas tank because the engine is designed to run on gas. We're designed to run on behind Jesus. And to enjoy him. 
So Jesus is like, talk about the heart of worship. Jesus is stripping away everything and getting us to understand this high calling. It's not a call because we're smarter than somebody else. We're more gifted than anybody else. We've got better ideas than anybody else. The better ambition is not about our ambitions, not about our dreams, not about our vision. It's about following and trusting him. What's interesting about these three statements, and he's talking to three different people, and they all call him Lord. <laughs> they all call him Lord, Master. They all call him Teacher. They recognize that Jesus has something of value, something of, of worth, something worthy to be followed. They've seen him do, they fed the 5,000. They've seen him do uh, healing people. They've seen him do great things, and, and, and they, so they're, they're it's not that they're that they're they're trying to get over their unbelief. They recognize that this guy has has something something to say, and worthy to be followed. So it's it's not it's not so they're 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 almost there. And the first one, verse fifty-seven, says. Uh, is a call, the high calling to follow Jesus is a call to trust, number one. And the first one, he says, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Doesn't that sound just like Peter? It's not Peter, but Peter says it, doesn't he? Peter sticks his foot in his mouth so many times. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to take on. And Jesus says, Peter, kind of pats him on the head, Peter, Peter, Peter. Before the end of the day, you're going to deny me three times. You know, just like, let's get real here. And here, so here, you know, so it's, it's not unusual. There's this one say, I'm going to, I'm going to follow you. They're like, look, what, look at all the cool stuff that you've done. I'm going to follow you. And he says, uh, so Jesus, for the first thing he does is like, uh, like, all right, you really don't know what, careful what you pray for. You really don't know what you're asking. And he uses this phrase and it's, and Jesus, these phrases, and we got to understand these phrases. Jesus is, and he talked about the, the foxes. He's not talking about foxes. He's not talking about, uh, you know, the dead, let the dead bury their dead. The, let the, let the um, you know, go. He's, he's using, he's actually using culturally some very famous, um, it's a figure of speech. It's, uh, um, a, a, the, like common phrases people would use um, to describe something, he, and and he's and he's using it in a hyperbola. He's like over the top. Uh, this this figure of speech is designed to shock you. It's designed to whoa whoa wait a minute. What am I what am, what am I saying? What are you saying? And it and it does. Foxes have holes. Birds have. Have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have any anywhere to lay his head. And and, and the implication there is that you really don't add, you don't when you say I'm going to follow you, you really don't know what you're saying, because it's not a it's not all fun and games. It's not a walk through the rose garden. It, it's trouble. It's difficult. It's hard. Uh, it, it, you you have to give up. You really literally have to give up everything, and you have to trust God for everything. And that's and it, so that call to call to discipleship, the call to follow Jesus, is a call to to uh, to trust um, to trust God for every in everything, in the hardships, in the uncertainties, the difficulties, the dangers. And, and he's saying this phrase, and he's saying, "Listen, do you want to follow me? Or are you willing to pay the price?" Peter said, if you're going to follow, anyone who desires to live a godly life will suffer. You're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer trouble. Listen, I'm on my way to Jerusalem to be killed for this. Are you willing to die? Are you willing to lay your life down for this? It's a high calling. You see the high call? Like, like a high calling. And it costs us everything. Salvation was free. We couldn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It's a gift, the gift of eternal life. Now to that gift, to put it on, 
to follow Jesus, really, it's the gift of life. Again, it's the gift of design. It's the gift of why we, why we were created. It's our original design. It's, it's a gift of real living. But we've got to set, a, set aside the old way, the old man, set aside everything. You know, when we complain, I heard this, I forget who said it this week. Um, when we complain, you know what we're really saying when we complain? God, you missed it. God, you, your, your grace wasn't good enough. God, you, you, you really weren't paying attention. When we complain about... I mean, fill in the blank, anything. When we complain, we're, we're saying to God, your grace wasn't sufficient. You lie, you're a liar. It's called what it is. Well, to trust God in everything. This is what we're designed. I can't tell you where I heard this quote. It was recent in a conversation I had recently. But the quote, the quote was, uh, well, his initials were John Martin. Oh, and I can't tell you where I heard it, but here's, here's a question. How many of us can say that we are, that we have put ourselves in, that we are a bond slave of Christ? A bond slave is one who has just, just, Put their whole life in the hands of the owner. So Paul called himself. So Paul did. So the disciples did. Eventually they just like, here I am, Lord. Here I am. How many of us can truly say that we have, have allowed, and that what they would do is when a slave was available or had gotten to the point where they could be released, they paid their debt. They willingly stayed. And it would be a mark where they'd taken all and they'd put your ear up to the wall, barn wall, and would poke a, a, an awl through your ear. And that was the sign that you were willing, willingly put your hands and trust in God, the owner. I think it was, uh, no, no, it was Robertson that quoted Plummer that call that says uh, he calls um, us, calls us the casual disciples. <laughs> this one that's asking the question and really Jesus is challenging him on that question, on the question of following him. Plummer says. He calls them casual disciples, of which there is way too many. Jesus, in these questions, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. We say that. But Jesus is going to challenge that statement. And as a believer, if you're not willing to be challenged in that statement, if you're not willing to allow God to question you in what you're doing and why you're doing it, you're in, you're in for some big trouble. Because that's what Jesus is doing. I'm, I'm gonna, God, I'm going to do great things for you. Oh, really? Jesus says. You don't have any idea of the cost of what you just said. It's a high calling. And it's a call to trust God in everything. Why? Why can we trust God in everything? Listen. Why can we trust God in everything? Because he's trustworthy. Because he has demonstrated and proven himself to be trustworthy. He keeps every one of his promises. He does exactly what he says he's going to do. And he tells us why he's going to do it. And if you lack, if you lack an understanding, if you lack wisdom, just ask. It is Jesus in that's a high calling, it's a call to trust. 
not only is he trustworthy, worthy to be trusted, he's worthy to be worshipped. Only one worthy to be. We can trust in anything. We put our we put our trust in things. We're designed to put our trust in things. When you came in, you sat down. You trusted that the chair was going to. We trust. Our life is trust. While you're trusting Him, we're designed to worship. We're designed to worship, uh, and designed to worship. Are you worshiping Him? Why do we worship Him and Him alone? Because He's worthy to be tr- worthy to be worshipped. It's a high calling. Trust number two. The high calling is a call to humility. Again, if you're not willing to be challenged then Jesus says, I got nothing for you. Want to do it your way? Go ahead. You don't need me. This is what Jesus is saying. He said to another, he turned to another, and I'm not sure if he was just wanted to challenge, but he wanted to show the first guy. He said, let me show you what I'm talking about. Hey, you, follow me. Because he knew it was in this guy's heart. And he's like, well, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to follow you, Lord, but... But first, let me go bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury them. Jesus wasn't, he wasn't, again, the statement was designed to shock. The statement was designed to, 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 sometimes we need to be shaken, don't we? Sometimes I need to be shaken, don't I? When God shakes you, when the word of God shakes you, it's never fun, it's never pretty, but it's always good. I heard another quote yesterday by, or soon, recently. That, um, and I won't mention names, initials for John Martin. Uh, God doesn't want a steamroller for Jesus. What is he looking for? Broken and obedient hearts. Has God broken you yet? If not, pray that he does. Why? Because we need to pray not only enough to repent enough to be forgiven, but surrender enough to be changed. Because if this world's going to get flipped up for Jesus, we have to be changed so our church can change, so our community can change, so our nation can change, so the world can change. And so he wasn't saying, you know, dishonor your father. He's not saying dishonor your, your, your duties as a son. He wasn't saying that. And, and because the implication there, and everybody's like, and they're all like, well, there's a good chance when he said that, his father wasn't even dead yet. You know, it's just another excuse. Jesus was just pointing out the folly of our excuses. We all have them. They're like armpits. We all have excuses. They do. What's your excuse? His father probably wasn't even dead yet, and 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 even to declare him dead and wanted to wait for his inheritance, like the prodigal son, right? Going to his dad and asking for his inheritance was literally calling his, considering his dad already his father already dead. I declare you dead so I can get my inheritance. There, there was another, uh, uh, I forget who, who pointed out, in that, in that time period, first century, there was this tradition that had built up to where they would, when someone died, someone died, they would do the preparation for the body, much like the women were doing to Jesus' body when they went and didn't find him Sunday morning. Um, but they would wait a year for when the flesh, the decayed and they would take the bones and rebury them so it's like let me bury my wait can i go bury my father well i want to wait this year so i can take care of this responsibility and that was something there's nothing in scripture about that 
And it was something that had been built up as a tradition. Sometimes our traditions get in the way. Sometimes our theology gets in the way. this week um, was Matt Chandler. Sometimes you just got to set your theology aside and just weep. Just cry. Just pour your heart out to God. We know he's there. We know he's listening. We know he cares. But sometimes he just wants, he just, he loves, he specializes in broken hearts. God, is a, God has a specialty, and it's in broken hearts. Has he ripped the rug out from under your traditions and expectations and visions yet? It's never pretty, but I, and this is our prayer request, but it is part of the journey. It's part of this Jerusalem journey that we're on to follow Jesus. It takes humility to let Jesus do that. How do we let Jesus do this to us? We say, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. He's not violating the sacred duty of a son. What he is saying to follow Jesus is a, is a priority. It's a priority over our tradition. It's a prior traditions. It's a priority over our theology, our what we've formed, and what is a priority even over our visions and dreams and will. Jesus said it this way: Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added. The cost is high. It's a high calling to follow Jesus. And the willingness to be broken. The willingness to be challenged. The rich young ruler, Jesus challenged him. What can I do? I've done all the law. I've done all that. And Jesus said, go, go sell everything you have and follow me. Uh, that's not willing to be challenged. Not willing to be humbled by God, by the Holy Spirit. The, um, you know the difference? The, the willingness to be challenged, number one, I'm going to guarantee it's going to hurt. Being hurt by it, being challenged by Jesus, is not the issue. A hurt, being hurt by it, is biblical response. Because that being hurt, being confused, being challenged, I, I, I got I thought I was doing what you want me to do, but okay, if you want me to sh you gotta show me, show me your wisdom, and and it's this the it, it, the hurt carries a conversation with it with God as he drags you through the ringer we evaluate and we 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 God shows us something we repent and we turn from it and it, and, it, and we do that we we continue to surrender and 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 the hurt is is part of it but then we press forward Paul Philippians 3 I turn from that and I keep pressing forward I keep reaching the interesting, fascinating verse in 2 Corinthians 7. Can we look at 2 Corinthians 7 for a second? You can find it. John, Acts, Romans. You'll find it. 2 Corinthians 7. This was a guy who in 1 Corinthians was challenged. And called out. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, he's like verse 8. Verse 
verse 8, I, for I made you sorry by my letter. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not sorry about it. <laughs> I'm not sorry that I made, sometimes leaders, sometimes the, the, the hard part of ministry, the hard part of leadership and ministry is sometimes we have to challenge people's actions. It's not the fun part. But actually, if you go back and what you signed when you became a member was giving us permission to speak truth into your life. It's part of the deal. So Paul says, I, I spoke truth into your life, and I'm not sorry that it hurt. Verse 8, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, it's not that I enjoyed it. For I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, but only for a little while, but only for a while. It depends on what you do with that. For now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss, that you might suffer loss, loss from us in nothing. Now that sorry that that it hurt. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, leads to reconciliation. Godly sorrow leads to. But the problem is, you know, what the problem is, the church doesn't know how to respond biblically to these problems. We'd rather respond in anger. We'd rather respond in blame. Anything and everything. And where does anger and blame come? It comes right from the garden. Adam got mad at God and blamed him. That woman that you gave me. Godly sorrow. This is the high call. The high call is a call to humility. Godly sorrow is to hit the ground, face to the ground. God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Forgive me. Restore me. Empower me. It's a high call. Are you willing to be broken? Number three, the high calling is a call to surrender. He says to another, or another one, Jesus just spoke to the second one, follow me, the third one said to him, where am I, verse, verse 61, Lord, Lord, I'm going to follow you, but but let me go back and take care, let me go back and say goodbye, let me, I, got, I got some business to take care of, I got some things to do, let me go take care of all that first, and then I'll then I'll follow. I'll give you. I'll, I'll, it's another excuse. And Jesus says to you, the, "No one having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven." What does he mean by that? What he means is, and another way of saying it is, you can't plow a straight line when you're looking backwards. We're going to follow Jesus and resolutely set our face on him. We've got to follow him. Because you can't follow him and look back, looking backwards. It's actually kind of hard to plow a straight line or rake a straight line of hay when you're falling asleep, too, by the way. <laughs> Just saying. You gotta be paying attention. If you're gonna follow me, you can't be looking backwards. Follow me, you gotta be looking at me. Please let me go back and bid farewell to those who are in my house. Let me go get my affairs in order. And it wasn't that you gotta have you don't get your affairs in order. It's not that you don't care about your family. What he was it was just another excuse. It was another God is just pointing out the folly of our reasoning behind reasons why we can't follow you right now. What's your reason? 
but your excuse. Not paying attention to the first things. Second things aren't the problem. The second things are not the problem. As long as, they're, as, long as they remain second things. When we make the first things, when we make the second things first things, that's where we get in trouble. The I the, I think the thing here is we design, we 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 we. Jesus says you got to follow me here here. Follow, he says no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to design my own way of following Jesus. That's what we do. That's what the world does. We're, well. You know, that's a little too, that, so let's do it this way. Don't we? We do it all the time. The church is done. I don't know why the church is such a mess. Not this church, I don't believe. You want to, Jesus says you want to do it your way? Go ahead. <laughs> you don't need me. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus. And I need my way pointed out to me so I can put it where it belongs. The high calling is a call to surrender. One more quote from recent conversations. It wasn't, it wasn't JM. It was PS. Which, by the way, may I say Paul Schutzbach? You, you know why Paul, Paul and Carrie haven't been to church in a while? Because he's been preaching in Morris, Morris Baptist Church. He announced to us yesterday that they're going to vote on him being their pastor. Praise the Lord. So this guy, Paul S., who I, heard this I heard this quote recently. He said, "It's these guys were hot yesterday. Man, they were like, I'm like, give me a pen. i got to write this down. It was what? Sermon prep. That's why I go to the sap house. Uh, you didn't hear? If you, it, it's not, <laughs> here it is. You ready? P.S. It's not surrendering to God if you're only doing what, doing what you want to do. It's not surrendering to God if you're only doing what you want to do. Stanley said, however, what we have to do is relinquish control to him. Because having Christ live through you is is the most awesome experience you'll ever have. Following Jesus is a high calling. It's a call to trust. It's a call to humility. It's a call to surrender. Am I willing to be challenged? Am I willing to go through the hurt of being examined by the Holy Spirit? Search me, try me, see if there's any wicked way in me. We're called to trust the Lord with all our heart. And to lean not on our own understanding, but to acknowledge him in some of our ways. All of our ways. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We have to admit that we've been living by our excuses. Admit and confess and agree with God that it is what it, it's what it is. It's sin. And as soon as, as, soon as we do that, we experience the forgiveness of the cross, the release of the power of the blood of Jesus, the cleansing, the empowerment, the greater knowledge of Christ. As soon as we obey, we, we grow in our understanding of what it is to follow Christ. We walk in his presence, his Holy Spirit, his wisdom, wisdom from heaven. The, the benefits of following this high call of to follow Jesus, the benefits are out of this world. We surrender. We're not no longer double-minded, James says, and tossed to and fro by everything that comes along. We experience that grace, rescuing grace, transforming grace. 
the, the peace that passes understanding, the comfort from the God of all comforts, comforts our hearts and leads us. We become flexible. We become teachable. We become coachable. We come with, and which standing on a rock provides stability in this craziness, steadfastness, because we know who we are, we know who we're following, and we know where he's going. When I wrote all that down, I thought about old Delmar and uh, um, Brother Where Art Thou. When he got baptized, he came in. Come on in, boys. The water's fine. <laughs> Jesus says, come and follow me. Heavenly Father, we are thankful. We're thankful for that you cared enough about us to send your son to die for us, to die for our sin, to die for its penalty, and now releasing us and teaching us um, uh, to, uh, and dying uh, uh, from its influence as we daily, daily die to ourselves and daily set our, our eyes, our heart, our minds, our life resolutely on Jesus. Father, we use a bread and a little piece of bread and a little piece of, of uh, a little little taste of grapefruit, uh, grape juice to just remind us of the sacrifice that Christ offered to provide for us this real life, restored life, living, eternal life that begins right now and it lasts forever. Father, help us to get over ourselves. Help us to teach us your way, your will, to, to trust in you in all things. Even as these lessons come along, that we would take up these lessons, learn from them, and enjoy you, your presence, every step of the way. So we take the bread and the cup, we remember Jesus' willingness. We remember his, his, um, his, the humility of, uh, uh, of coming as a servant a slave. We remember his total trust in you. Father, I trust you and I'll follow you. And we remember that he did that for us, that we might know and experience everlasting life, eternal life today in Jesus' name.